This is the lecture for Monday, the 1st of February, 2021. European history. For those of you at home, there'll be a couple of videos to look at, which you should see sometime in relation to this video. Where we've been is... Remember to take your chapter 21 quiz, uh, which will also be posted. We were working in the Marxian Bible, the money, or Das Kapital. We had talked about uh, the peasantry, the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, the aristocracy, the centrality of class struggle, and the relig uh, fact that religion is the opiate of the masses. Uh, the belief, uh, according to Marx, that religion is the opiate of the masses. Then on Friday, we talked about Marx's focus on history and talks about the historical processes that will lead humanity, in his judgment, from slavery to freedom, from bondage to equality. And these three ages of humanity are, first of all, the feudal age, Feudalism is roughly equivalent to the agrarian period, from the time that we leave the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to the time that we develop industry. So basically the feudal social order, the pyramid structure, which I've talked to you about, is the norm wherever you are in the world, whether you're in Central America, East Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, or the Mediterranean. All of these civilizations up through Napoleon, uh, are one or another variant of feudalism. So Marx, for example, doesn't make much of a big deal about the Enlightenment philosophies of the 18th century or of the American or French revolutions, um, because they are still rooted in the economics of agrarianism, and there is still, in effect, a structure of hierarchy that describes society that is not rooted in economics. Marx is an economic determinist. What that means is that economics trumps all other factors. Thus, a person's primary identity is that of uh, their social class, what they do for a living, how they earn money, how they fit into the society as producers. So feudalism is determined by all of this. And it is the age when the peasantry is exploited by the aristocracy where one inherits one's identity through birth, and in both cases, learning is sort of a languid, slow process that happens over decades of time. There isn't the kind of intense focus on learning that one gets in a technical society or in a modern school. Both the aristocracy and the peasantry, therefore, are sort of holdovers in the second age of mankind, and their abilities are somewhat less than the two industrial age classes. The second age of mankind is the age of capitalism. It is an age brought about through the brilliance of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie, in their greed, want to make a living and perhaps want to get rich. And so what they do is they come up with innovations in products and in services, new ways of providing the necessities and the options of life to a, uh, a consumership hungry for a better world, a better life. So uh, Arkwright, Richard Arkwright, comes up with his water frame device, and Eli Whitney comes up with the cotton gin, and whoever, whoever comes up with the flying shuttlecock. And all of these various innovations, in those three cases, inventions, are going to revolutionize the production of cloth, and later the production, pr pr uh, the production of clothing, and analogs to them will reform everything from the making of steel, the Bessemer process, uh, to allow uh, electroplating of steel, large-scale steel production, which is going to lead the world to the 20th century, 
uh, as well as the modern chemi chemical industry and so forth. Marx sees these innovations as a good and necessary thing that come at a terrible cost. The, uh, in the bourgeoisie, first of all, uses their new wealth and power to create a subservient working class, the proletariat, the industrial working class. But in doing so, they are sowing the seeds of their own destruction. They literally are giving birth to their own nemesis because as the bourgeoisie is defined by their brilliant ideas, the ideas that will change production from cottage industry to factory town, that will increase the uh, material wealth uh, of, of the human spirit, of the human species, should I say. The proletariat <coughs> is going to be built from the clay that is the peasantry. But in order to be a successful prole, they need to engage in the intensive education that you are familiar with here. They need to be able to function in a mechanized world and in a world where they are expected to become part of a whole that is more than the sum of its parts, that is uh, constantly changing, and that requires both a capacity to learn and a capacity to function in tandem, in concert. And therefore, as the peasants free, the proletariat will come, especially if they're educated in class consciousness, they will come to resent their subservient status. They will come to uh, resent being exploited. They will come to resent working their hearts out for slave wages while their factory owners and their bosses become wealthy. But unlike the peasants, proletariat, because of its nature, as educable and used to working with machines and used to working together, is actually going to make a formidable revolutionary social class. The peasants were hopeless, the proletariat is the hope of Marx's dreams. And that will usher in the age of communism. Workers will literally seize the means of production they will engage in what in the 1930s were called sit-down strikes. Not strikes where you have sign-waving protesters outside the factory, but protests that take over the factory floor. Railroadmen take over the railroads. Coal miners take over production of coal. Uh, factory workers take over the factories. And when the workers actually command, because they are in possession of, the means of production, they can then use this to cut off their enemies. Suddenly, money won't count for anything. The coal will only be provided by the coal miners to fellow revolutionary workers. The railroadmen will no longer move anyone. They'll move people who are part of their revolution. The factory workers will continue to produce goods, but they will only be distributed to those that the revolution says should be given. Resources. And the same is true at all levels. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. In taking control of the means of production, the workers will have stolen the uh, fulcrum of modern economics. The means of production, which are basically factories and the whole factory system, is what gives people outsized uh, surpluses of food, of goods, uh, and that is the key to the modern lifestyle. Without the bourgeoisie, you wouldn't have the kind of progress that led to the creation of the means of production. But now, in the age of communism, the workers have taken control of the means of production, and they are going to use that control to boycott anyone that isn't them. In other words, they're going to apply raw force. If you deprive somebody of food that needs food, if you deprive somebody of power that needs heat in the wintertime, you are engaging in a form of violence. You are using force. Moreover, Marx was not at all averse to the use of force in the seizure of the means of production. In fact, he says that it's essential. 
So party discipline becomes a huge deal to communists. For example, to be a member of the Communist Party of the United States of America, you have to pay dues. It may sound funny. You're a communist and yet you've got to pay money and dues. Everyone has to pay their dues. Rich or poor, worker or academic, people who can afford it and people who can't. You all pay your dues. If you're hungry on the street, but you're an active member of the Communist Party USA, you pay your dues. And the reason is, it's an earnest, it's a symbol that we are all sacrificing for the revolution. If you are a member of the Communist Party USA, and the Communist Party USA tells you to get a certain degree, and get a certain kind of job, and work within a certain industry for our benefit, you do that. If the Communist Party says you will seduce and sleep with this unattractive person in order to blackmail them and get information from them, you will do it. If the Communist Party says you will riot uh, at the police station at such and such a day at such and such a time, you will do it. The belief that Communists share is a religious fervor. It is millenarian. Instead of like the early Christian church waiting breathlessly for the arrival of the second coming of Christ, instead of like the Jewish religion, which generation after generation eagerly awaits the arrival of the Messiah, communists don't wait. Communists work for the coming millennium. They work for the coming utopia on earth. They work to bring about the revolutionary day of the Lord so that they can bring about the peace, the thousand years of peace, the heaven on earth, the new Jerusalem. The world will be purged of its greed and it will be purged of its evil, but only through the dedication and willingness to serve of the Communist International. When I played for you last week the song, The Internationale, that is the anthem of international communism. And communism absolutely sees itself in internationalist terms. So, all of this comes together. Seizing the means of production requires a military-type discipline. Party discipline, therefore, is absolutely militant. If the party says die, you die. If the party says love, you love. If the party says lie, you lie. If the party says betray, you betray. You do not have the right to have your individual conscience stay in the way of a better future coming. You've got to understand this. Like all other committed people, communists are not merely anti-capitalists. They are not merely negatives. They have an affirmative belief in something. They believe that Marx has interpreted history more clearly than anyone else. They believe in the inevitability of their victory. It's only a matter of time. And the only thing that can stop the communist revolution is if people who are communists no longer serve communism with the kind of dedication that Ignatius of Loyola expected from his Jesuit priests back during the Counter-Reformation. You are a part, a, you are privileged to be a part of the vanguard of history. But your part is not to command, your part is to obey. Only through rising up in the ranks of the party do you learn what the party really needs done. And then, and only then, do you have the right to command others. So, there is an absolutely pliable servility among communists that is shocking to most people because they don't expect it. This is the supreme dedication. It's the same type of dedication that our jihadi enemies have in the war on terror when they strap a bomb vest on, go out to a mall, and detonate it. It is the same kind of dedication that the kamikaze had in World War II when they strapped into a Japanese plane, took off, flew their way in a kikusui, a flying chrysanthemum, towards American carrier groups, and dived onto a target terminally, or strapped into a torpedo, or strapped into a rocket bomb. The Japanese had all three types of kamikaze. And also there's the kamikaze of being desperate in a land battle and doing what you can to draw in American troops. You, you feign surrender, 
and then when the Americans come close enough, you pull the grenade and you kill Americans as you die. That dedication, as horrifyingly scary as it is to most of us, is the same dedication because communism is a religion in the sense that it has a dogma, which is described in Das Kapital. It has scripture. Das Kapital is the chiefest of their scriptures. It has saints. It has martyrs. It has all the panoply of a good functioning religion. And its goal is to bring about heaven on earth from a materialistic point of view. Physical paradise from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And if you believe in that, your private qualms, your what the Enlightenment would call conscience, doesn't matter. If you're a committed communist, you are a committed communist, that's it. You serve the interests of the party. And so some communists in the United States have led completely false lives as underground agents and moles. And it was some of these who gave the atom bomb secrets to the Russians in the 1940s. Joseph McCarthy in the McCarthy era was a low point in American civil discourse and American civil liberties. But McCarthy was not reacting to nothing. There was a very present communist threat. It was quite real. And Stalin and the Soviet Union commanded all communist parties, including the Communist Party USA, for the goal of giving Soviet communism domination over the world. Revolution against what that flag represents is part and parcel of being a communist. So this new way of looking at the world was something that brought out the best and the worst in people. I can't fault anyone who has a belief that's so strong that they're willing to die right here, right now for it. I can't fault the dedication of somebody who thinks that they are serving such a greater good that they're willing to violate every personal limit that they have. And yet I can. It is the best and worst in people that such zealotry brings out. The Nazis had it. The communists had it. The Jesuits had it. Christians had it. Jews had it. Um, Hindus have it. Uh, Buddhists have it. Some atheists have it. Some pagans have it. It is what a conviction does to a person. And this is something that you should think about. Because one of the glories of our era, of our moment in time, is that as an American, the default Judeo-Christian settings that have been with us as a part of Western civilization since the Emperor Constantine's time in the 300s AD, that is now no longer required of you. You have the option of exploring a variety of belief systems and of choosing to believe in one. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that because we no longer require that you uh, take on, on yourself Judeo-Christian values, that values are unimportant. Values are actually one of the most important things to a human being. Values are right up there with love in terms of life-affirming, life-changing things. And you should consider the freedom that you have to decide what you stand for, what you believe in. It's a terrible and awesome and wondrous responsibility. And not many generations have it. And so many people who do have it because it's optional don't appreciate it. They just take it for granted. And their dedication is soft and flabby and non-serious. You know, these people are serious. Um, violence is, per, is preferred because violence clarifies. And the dictatorship of the proletariat is what will result. It's like a body cast or a splint. It is something designed to hold society in its new place until memory of the old withers and dies. The pro dictatorship of the proletariat is something Marx talked in vague terms about. What Marx meant by it was that the workers would only feed the non-workers if the non-workers adopted workers' convictions and belief systems, if non-workers joined in with the communist mentality. 
Then they'd get fed. Otherwise, they'd wither and die. They would starve. The state would wither away. The church would wither away. The family would wither away. All traditional institutions would wither away. Even eventually the party would wither away because it would be no longer necessary because everyone, everyone would believe the same thing. All it requires is the annihilation of memory. All it requires is the destruction of history. If you get sufficiently past the revolution that no one is alive who remembers life before the revolution, then you're close to achieving the goal. The goal is an absolute nurture over nature approach to human development. What makes a person, this is a great debate in psychology, is a person made up by their genetics, racists would argue that. Is a person made up by their environment, behavioralists would argue that. Communists are absolute behavioralists. They don't care at all about one's genetics. They don't care at all about one's history. In fact, those are stumbling blocks. Kill the past, destroy it, annihilate its memory, and create a new utopia that no one in it has any idea can be deviated from. If you never teach a child about freedom, they won't necessarily be free. Well, if you never cheat, teach a child about dissent, they won't necessarily understand what dissent is or how to do it. If all that you teach them is the good orthodoxy. The assumption of communists is that as the old memories die out among the living population, that our nature will be retrained into a utopian mold, sir, and then this. So I've heard that like a discussion topic, I guess, the nurture versus nature, a whole ton, because I have a twin, you know, me and my brother. Yeah. We grew up in the same environment. All, all our lives, yep. and we were treated the exact same, knew the exact same people for mm -hmm. forever, but mm -hmm. as you can probably attest to, we couldn't be more different. Twins are often like that, because they have to describe, define their own individuality. One of my girlfriends in high school was a twin. Uh, I have twin sisters. They're fraternal, not identical. Like you and your brother are fraternal, not identical. They're still twins. They were womb mates. They, like all twins, have a little language between one another, a certain basic understanding. And um, what that means is, in order for you to be you, you can't be him. He can't be you. You play off of one another. And every set of twins I've ever seen that grow up together always, almost on purpose, diverge. It's natural, but it's also necessary. You see what I mean? Very few identical twins are similar personalities. Very few. Now, on the other hand, if you had been separated soon after birth, at that point, I wonder if under different circumstances, you would have arrived at similar personalities. That's an open question uh, because you wouldn't have each other to play off of. You wouldn't have to define yourself as the non-him. He wouldn't have to define himself as the non-you. Do you have any thoughts on that before I go on? Uh, I mean, it's probably more likely, but there is also the fraternal thing. Like, if I think it would be more likely that that personality thing would happen if it, we were identical, given genetics. Yeah. But also, who knows? Who knows? Um, you know, by the way, the truth is it's both. Yeah. It's always both. And more than either of those is culture. Culture is the system of beliefs that you have, that you grow up in. If you grow up in a culture that's violent and brutal, you're probably going to be violent or brutal. If you grow up in a culture that's peaceful and tolerant, you're probably going to be more peaceful and tolerant. Culture matters, which is why it is so important for people who come from ghettoized communities to get into the mainstream. By getting into the mainstream, they slough off that whole limited world. And it can be done through culture. I know because my family on all sides did it. Yes. I feel like the biggest issue with, like, communism is, you know, it's a great, like, I think it's a great idea in theory, um, however, usually when it's applied, it seems like there's always, you know, either a dictator, it's not actually true communism, mm -hmm. and so I think the biggest issue is, like, always going to be human nature, because even if we have um, a society where kids are raised and they're, you know, raised to not know these words and they can't know. 
I feel like there's always going to be curiosity because it's just something that's like natural as you get as you grow up and so someone's always going to think like well what happens if I do this what mm -hmm. happens if I do this so it's like you're never going to reach that perfect society because there's always going to be someone who's different or and somebody who wonders yeah I, I absolutely agree with you here's why with this exception I think communism is actually one of the worst ideas that we've ever come up with because it's not fit for human beings if we were drones like insects, like bees or, or like ants, then it would work. Because drones don't have the kind of individual capacity for wonder that we do. Drones are not creative the way we are. In reality, the, the palette that you paint your life on, the canvas that you paint your life on, should I say, is your human nature. To come up with a theory that's in defiance of all human nature, for human beings, to me, is nothing less than sadism or masochism. It's cruelty. You're engaged in pain and embracing pain that's needless. Why would we embrace an ideal that is so at variance with our nature? Also, have you ever noticed lots of people loving to be programmed? I don't think so. I don't believe that human beings like it when everything in their environment reinforces a certain ideal. I think that naturally people will rebel because if nothing else, that's how, according to psychology, we individuate. In other words, at first we worship our parents, then we discover the feet of clay of our parents, then we discover our peers, then we rebel. And that rebellion can happen between adolescence and college, but it inevitably must happen. At some point, you have to attack the, parent, the parents that you heretofore loved and respected in some way, shape, or form just to be you. That very idea in psychology is denied by socialists and communists because the, the utopia is based on our capacity and en masse to reshape human nature. Unless you put wetware in a human nervous system, which is computer parts, or unless you raise everyone in the manner of being brainwashed, in which case you'll cripple them physically, emotionally, psychologically. Unless you're willing to do those things, or unless you're willing to give everyone a full frontal lobotomy, you're not going to achieve the, uh, the utopia that they talk about because we can't live in utopia. We're not perfect. And if I actually think that our imperfections are what make us wonderful. Because of our imperfections, we can survive in great adversity. We can defy overwhelming odds. We can come up with new ideas. We are not merely the products of our environment. This is something I absolutely disagree with people on the left about. No, poverty is not an excuse for crime. Poverty happens, crime happens, but there are choices involved. We are choice-making creatures. We make judgments. You wonder why it's so scary for people to make judgments. Because what you're doing is, just, is you're saying, this is true, that is false. We are making judgments. We are deciding important things. So, <clears throat> I don't believe, I don't believe that people, I've ever met a person who's capable of living in one. Now, if we develop sufficient AI, and if we turn, if it turns out that artificial intelligence has its own nature and its own nature is naturally communitarian, then I could see a hive mind developing among them. But to turn human beings into hive creatures has never made sense to me. And the reason that it always ends up in body bags, millions and millions of body bags, is the belief, which comes from Marx, that you can kill your way to utopia. All you have to do is, is, like Robespierre, cut off the right heads. And if you cut off the right heads, you're engaged in like, you know what topiary is? Topiary is, uh, does anyone know? Can I explain it? Japanese do it with bonsai trees. Yeah. It's not the shaping. Yeah. With like yeah. The yeah. So you have a, a dense little uh, a piece of undergrowth that's designed to grow all bushy. And what you do is you, 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 you coif it like a French poodle. 
You give it a poodle cut. <laughs> you give you, you turn the tree into a bunch of balls or into a triangle or into a smiley face or whatever. That's topiary, as I understand. Um, communists believe you can do that to human nature. But understand what that means is that you are literally cutting off limbs of the of the tree to give it that shape. In the case of a French poodle with a poodle cut, I I my first dog was my aunt's royal standard poodle. Cognac was his name. He was this beautiful dog, and he was he had, he had a noble personality, and he was loyal. And gosh, he didn't like strange men because when he was a puppy, she rescued him. He he was beaten by a guy. Cognac um, never had one of those poodle cuts. But the way he looked at other poodles that did was not with, I think on some level, animals know when you're laughing at them. <laughs> Don't laugh at them because they're around you when you sleep. Okay? And animals may love you, but no, that doesn't teach them to love you. Uh, that it really doesn't. Giving them what you're doing is you are destroying what nature intended to build something man-made. That's topiary, and um, I think that playing God with other people's consciousness and lives usually results in predictable dystopia. Uh, be clear on the difference in terms between capital and surplus value. Capital is profit, uh, paid to stockholders who invest in businesses. Surplus value is the additional value that you make from your production line being efficient that is split among all the various workers. Now, I guess we're going to do next time, tomorrow, we're going to talk about the variations on the socialist principle. Tomorrow also uh, will be the last day before our, our test. Wednesday, there will be a quiz uh, or an exam, I'm not sure which. Um, that will cover everything we've done in Unit 3, and that includes the Concert of Europe and the Congress of Vienna, it includes the Industrial Revolution, and it will include socialism and communism and all of that. Do you have a question? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, well, I do agree with you about like how communism probably definitely would not work. It sounds like John, uh, Marx's idea was that communism would start from successful capitalism, and all the examples of communism resulted from unhappy state capitalism. So, uh, yeah. Uh, there are people who deny Marx's solution, but they do say that Marx has valid critiques, at least of the early phase of industrialism. I'm not one of them, but I can understand and respect anyone who is, because he does critique. And uh, do a pretty good job. Anyway, thank you. Come again.